I'll go through what I <coughs> my files. Uh, yeah, yeah. you have like six, seven minutes. Yeah, so we have and then uh, we can talk some. Yeah, sounds good. Hello, good afternoon. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today um, at the uh, uh, EPC uh, Talks Geopolitics with uh, Mr. James Apathurai, uh, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary General for Innovation, Hybrid and Cyber. Welcome. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Jana Maisuradze. I'm the Junior Policy Analyst of the Europe in the World program here at the European Policy Center. Uh, let me tell you quickly about the EPC Talks Geopolitics series. It's a signature event uh, series that aims to bring high-level, globally renowned uh, decision makers, practitioners, academics, and thought leaders for a 45-minute interactive conversation on key issues relevant to Europe and its role in the world. Uh, so I'm delighted to have you here to speak about uh, NATO and what to expect about um, the uh, in, in the next uh, summit next week. Um, today we will discuss uh, emerging threats in the wake of Russian aggression against Ukraine, degree and types of threats that the world should be prepared to face in the near future, especially considering the waves of disinformation and hybrid uh, and cyber threats during the election year. Uh, not only here in the EU, but also in the US in November, as well as the expectations ahead of the NATO summit. Um, welcome again, and thank you for joining. Uh, before I pass the floor to our guest, let me give some housekeeping rules. Um, today, our session will last for 45 minutes. Uh, we will start with opening remarks from our guest, and then uh, we will have conversation about uh, the NATO, NATO summit expectations uh, as well as uh, what uh, we should expect in the next 75 years as NATO celebrates its 75th anniversary. And then I will move on to uh, the question and answer session with you. Uh, we will also have a round of uh, questions from our online audience. So uh, please put your questions in the Q&A box on Zoom. Uh, so without further ado, let me turn to our guest, uh, Mr. Apaturai, the floor is yours. So thank thanks. Is this working? Yes, great. Uh, so. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation and great to see all of you and those of you who I can't see. Uh, I was slightly embarrassed by this obviously 20 year old photo of my first day at work uh, when I left university. So uh, thanks for putting that up. Uh, so I, I, what I thought I would do because we're gonna talk about the summit uh, was maybe just run through a few of the issues that uh, I work on on a day-to-day -day basis because there may be an interesting basis for, for further discussion uh, and touch on the issues of, of uh, security. Uh, and I do, um, and my division does innovation, hybrid, cyber, but also uh, energy security, climate change, and uh, undersea uh, infrastructure protection. And I'll maybe just use those as a way of talking about larger issues. So innovation. Uh, NATO is really leaning in on innovation. You'll see at the summit in the communique uh, that comes out a lot of language on how we're going to do more, including how to accelerate or that we will accelerate the adoption of emerging technologies to do it faster, to do it at the speed of relevance. So why are we doing this? Uh, Ukraine is one reason. It's very clear that Ukraine is numerically outnumbered in every possible category. But part of the reason that they can stand on their own feet is uh, the innovative use of emerging technologies. They identify them, they test them, they scale them up and field them fast. Uh, and the innovation cycle in Ukraine is very, very quick, uh, meaning the time that it takes to do all that and have it neutralized by the Russians with their own innovation is very short. It's in weeks and months. So 
innovation is battle decisive. And by innovation, I mean very much dual use technologies. So Ukraine is, for example, fusing data from commercially available satellites that were put up into space to look at ice depths with information from drones that were made by people in their basement with app information from apps that have been given out to Ukrainians to uh, facial recognition technology, scraping Russian Facebook and fusing that with cameras to see where people are moving and using unencrypted Russian communications translated by commercially operated software and putting all that through a task oriented chatbot like chat GPT to get battle relevant information. They're using electric bicycles to go to the front and back because they're quiet, they're fast and they have no heat signature. So innovation is battle decisive. We're helping Ukraine. We have a uh, innovation roadmap my division has uh, put together that we have agreed with Ukraine. We just did a big hackathon to help them scale up drones. Uh, so that's one reason. Second is the larger question of uh, our economic competitiveness and geostrategic competition. Uh, and here, of course, China is highly relevant. China is very advanced. China has every right to innovate. Uh, but we also want to make sure that we are innovating uh, and we are protecting our ecosystem. Uh, and there's a tech tracker by the Australian Security Policy Institute that says that out of 44 emerging and disruptive technologies, China is ahead or on par with us in 37 of the 44. So, you know, we, we have our homework to do. Um, and that means, in my case, working with startups and uh, helping provide venture capital. So we have created in NATO uh, something like DARPA, for those of you who know DARPA, so something called Diana, which is providing funding challenges and funding to startups. And we've created a 1 billion euro venture capital fund. It's the fourth biggest VC in Europe and the biggest in when it comes to defense uh, to help provide this funding, stimulate uh, innovation. So that's what we're doing. And you'll see language on that uh, in the summit. Uh, Second, I would mention cyber. Uh, we definitely see a deteriorating situation when it comes to cyber attacks against us. That is Russia, and it is also China. Uh, Russia is conducting all kinds of hostile cyber attacks uh, or Russian-based threat actors against our countries, against our political parties, against our political system, against our critical infrastructure. A lot of the ransomware that is uh carried out is actually a cover for the implantation of malware including into industrial control systems uh to be able to use when they want to uh raise the uh tensions uh so we are raising our game when it comes to cyber uh that includes raising the standards cyber for cyber protection of critical infrastructure so we had all allies agree last year on a higher standard and steps to get there uh, and we're helping them to do that. The EU is, of course, very, very important in this area as well and is doing a fantastic job, including with Nice 2 and others. Uh, so we definitely see that we have to raise our game on cyber because the Russians are raising theirs and they have very effective threat actors. Uh, China also uh, is posing a cyber threat to us. Uh, and you might have heard of Volt Typhoon. The Americans have come out and made it very clear that there's a big problem uh, with Chinese malware uh, being implanted into critical infrastructure. We see many examples of that beyond the ones that are public. So we have to do more. We also have to uh, do more to call out these kinds of cyber attacks. So we are doing a lot of that. Uh, and uh, of course, we have to be able to impose costs. Uh, and that doesn't just mean, uh, doesn't mean at all if you cyber attack me, I cyber attack you. No, we have to take correct legal steps that include diplomatic steps, economic steps, et cetera, like sanctions uh, or other measures. But we don't want to just do tit for tat. That's not the way we we operate. But these, these are very important. You'll see some language on that at the summit as well. Uh, then there's hybrid. And, and that folds into, or cyber folds into that. We can see now across Europe also across the United States, but in particular across Europe, an increase in what we call hybrid attacks, so malign non-military attacks. And that includes 
an increase in sabotage, in particular over the last six to eight months. That means uh, trains being derailed, bus stations being set on fire, uh, warehouses being set on fire. That, of course, goes uh, attacks on politicians, attacks on politicians' property. Uh, we've seen assassinations. And most of these can be laid at the foot of the Russians. Uh, so we went through a period where we had uh, NATO countries had expelled a substantial number of Russian so-called diplomats. Uh, and then we saw a downturn in this kind of malign intelligence activity, but it is increasing again. That goes along with a full range of hybrid uh, attacks. Uh, so disinformation, which we can talk about more, now a little bit more and more enabled by deepfakes, political interference, hacks on political parties, as we saw, for example, with the SPD in Germany, uh, forced migration, uh, for example, across the Finnish border. We saw it in Norway. We saw it in the Baltic states. We saw it out of Moldova. Uh, economic pressure we saw uh, as well. Uh, so these are oh, uh, jamming of uh, civilian uh, flights, especially in the Baltic Sea. So this is all on the upturn. Uh, we are aware. We are tracking. We are making sure that we can see the patterns uh, and what I want to do now is also see the historical trends so we don't get a boiling frog problem where we just get used to one thing after the other, higher level, higher level, higher level. Uh, the intent from the Russians is to create disquiet and also to undercut support to Ukraine. I think in neither case is it working, but we have to deal with it. Uh, and we have uh, steps to take to, to deal with it. But that will, I think, be a growing issue, and you'll see language on that in the summit. I know I'm talking too long, so I'll, I'll stop in a second. Three other issues. Climate. Uh, we will, at the summit, release an updated report on the security implications of climate change. We have new measures to adapt our forces and our installations to climate change, meaning more disaster relief, more heat, et cetera. So you need new engines, new training, new facilities, better protection for your ports, and steps to cut greenhouse gas emissions for the NATO enterprise. So we'll do that. Final point is energy security. Uh, there is an energy transition underway. We all know that. Accelerated by two things, uh, getting off Russian oil and gas and uh, the commitments we've all made in Paris and elsewhere to go green. Uh, what my job is, is to ensure that we do this in a way that uh, ensures military capability, military interoperability uh, through the transition and out the other end. Meaning, if each country is making decisions on what kind of energy mix they're going to have, and therefore what kind of equipment they're going to have, but it's not compatible it's not designed, then we could end up in a situation where we can't fight together. We can't fuel each other. We can't plug in together, right? Until now, we've had a single fuel policy. Everything works together. But now that's all changing. So to give you just two examples, and then I'll stop. Uh, one of our countries, General, came to see me, and they were proud because they're field testing an armored personnel carrier that's electric. I said, that's super, but my friend has an Audi e-tron and he can't plug into a Tesla supercharger network in Belgium. So if you drive to Poland with that thing, which is what you would do to defend Poland, uh, can you plug it in? And he didn't know the answer because they hadn't thought of that. Or to give you another example, we'll give two more examples. Uh, more than 50% of the ships that are being built now will run not on traditional fuels but on ammonia or on methanol so if spain chooses ammonia and canada my country chooses methanol then when a spanish ship shows up in canada is there going to be the the energy they need to fuel their ships because are we going to build it even though that's not our choice i doubt it so that's another issue and then i'll give you a third one because it's relevant to the military and civilian world uh the Petrol stations in Norway, for example, and increasingly in Denmark are being subsidized because more and more people are moving to electric. Those gas stations aren't going to be around in 10 years. It's going to be the same in Germany. 
but we will still be using traditional engines. And we're going to show up with 20,000 troops that need gas. So where are they going to get it? Where are they going to get the electricity as we hybridize our fleets? When we show up, again, 20,000 troops in a day and we plug it in, can the grid handle it? I don't think so. So we need to talk to the energy companies as well to say, you need to take into account our requirements. Uh, we also need to protect the undersea infrastructure, very much at risk. Uh, the Russians have something called the Russian Undersea Research Program, which has been mapping out all of our infrastructure. We saw the sabotage of Nord Stream, the damage in Baltic Connector. So we've set up a network to help secure it, uh, help the companies uh, secure it. So that these are just some of the things I'm doing. Doesn't count what anybody else in NATO is doing, which we're going to talk about now. But uh, just yeah. to give you that as a starting point. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this overview. So we have uh, innovation, cybrid, uh, cyber, I just created a new word, yeah, cyber. Uh, cyber, hybrid, uh, climate, energy security. And uh, you uh, rightly mentioned that uh, uh, there are people who are outsmarting us like Russia and uh, China. Uh, and we also see that Russia, a direct threat to the alliance, has shifted its economy to a war footing, uh, spending 6% of its GDP. Um, do you think the alliance is ready to um, handle this? And uh, what kind of uh, innovations are uh, done to uh, outsmart them? And how will the smart defense look like? Uh, also, we have a so-called uh, electronic warfare gap. Uh, how, how is the alliance handling this? And what is the vision? Uh, that uh, that we're going to see for the future. So, I, I think there's a couple of points. One is I think the six percent is a super low figure. That's what they say. It's more like thirty percent of the Russian economy is being spent on defense and security issues in the broader sense. Everything is being put on a war footing, uh, and. That includes, of course, a substantial amount of the population is moving into this business. And so that leads me to the next point is we have to recognize and people just need to get their head around the fact that we will have for a decade at least a well-armed, aggressive, slightly paranoid and expansionistic government run by one person. Uh, that's just the reality. And it means we have to do much more uh, in the way of constraining, containing uh, Russia. Uh, whether we want it or not, it's the way it is. Mm -hmm. So that's one point. On the other hand, we have 10 times the economy that Russia does uh, put together. Uh, so we have a lot of resources. We have super effective modern forces that can work together. Uh, and what you'll see out of the summit is a number of decisions to ramp up new plans, new capabilities. We're moving them forward. A lot more troops on, well, that's not a new decision, but a lot of like hundreds of thousands of troops on uh, short notice to move. So uh, I'm not that worried. And I would also say, if you look at the way Russia has behaved throughout this war, they talk a lot about NATO, but have made no moves to try to take on NATO. And they don't want a fight with NATO because they know they'll lose it. Uh, so there's a lot of rhetoric, but no military reality. So you see all this low level stuff, the hybrid stuff, but from a military point of view, they don't, mm -hmm. they don't make any attempts in that, in that regard. And we are ramping up our, our uh, defense industry. There is more money than there is industry right now, but industry will catch up to the money. And those, um, those, uh, Capabilities will soon be uh, making themselves uh, making themselves manifest. Russia has also lost a lot of its intellectual capital. A lot of the smartest people who could get out did. Uh, sanctions will also continue to bite on their ability to get access to the latest technologies. Here we have profound concerns about what China is doing, uh, providing them advanced components. Uh, we know exactly what they are. Uh, it is quite substantial, and it has been essential for the Russian war effort. So there is an enabling element which uh, which we find quite negative, and that has been communicated to the Chinese government. But overall, uh, you're quite right that Russia is going to be a problem, and we need to do more to uh, be able to to constrain it. 
and preserve our own security and, and do as much as we can to support our partners, first and foremost, Ukraine, of course. Uh, but that over the long term, we need a long term perspective. You know, we all grew up in the time, the post-Cold War period where, you know, it looked great. And then you think like, oh, this unfortunate temporary period that we're in now. No, that was the temporary period. Indeed. What's not temporary is going to be this uh, hostile uh, and destabilizing Russia. Definitely. And uh, you mentioned uh, Ukraine and rightly so. Uh, what would be the expectations for Ukraine next week? Yeah, I mean, it has been quite a disappointment over last, uh, see, well, since 2008 with um, promises given and uh, never, never realized, not only for Ukraine, but also for Georgia with the, uh, with the war. And uh, so, so what would be the uh, open door policy towards Ukraine and Georgia next week? Uh, we cannot avoid this question, as uh, it's, you rightly also said that NATO, uh, that Russia will not attack NATO, but the fact that it's attacking uh, Ukraine and uh, Georgia, it's also hitting NATO's credibility. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure it hits NATO's credibility, but uh, bottom line, I mean, we can go through the whole history of these uh, issues. And of course, Ukraine went through a period where it was uh, constitutionally not seeking NATO's uh, NATO membership, as you recall, around 2014, non-bloc status. Uh, and this, of course, I think I, I want to mention that in part because it it makes it very clear that Russia attacking Ukraine has nothing to do with NATO membership. Russia attacked Crimea when Ukraine was constitutionally neutral. So all these arguments that they came up with that now are obviously untrue. Uh, that's not the reason they attacked because it, they wouldn't have at, at that at that period if it had anything to do with NATO membership. And that was a big, big land grab. Um, but your, your question is basically what's going to happen now. Uh, and, you know, it's a week before, you know very well, there's negotiations underway right now about what the precise language will be. Uh, and so I don't know what the precise language will be. But what you will see is a few things. Clear language, not just reaffirming Georgia's, uh, sorry, I'll come back to Georgia, Ukraine's uh, future membership in NATO, but some language to take that forward, whatever that will be. Uh, second will be uh, a clear commitment on funding Ukraine's uh, self-defense effort, funding for its military and its security. Uh, third will be a much bigger NATO long-term commitment to training and education for Ukraine. And the message that will come from the summit is that, yes, there are all sorts of political wins that flow here and there, including in all of our countries. And there's an election today, like there is apparently every uh, other day. But, uh, but that NATO's commitment is for the long term. And it will be concrete. It will be substantial, uh, not just political, but practical. Uh, so that message will, will come through very clear at the summit. Okay, that's uh, that's good to hear. Uh, I have many questions, but maybe I will leave it to the audience uh, for the Q and A uh, session, including if there will be criteria for uh, Ukraine for about membership. But you also mentioned elections, so let's uh, move towards that topic. I mean, there are big elections coming up in November that will probably uh, affect uh, Europe. Uh, I mean even more than the European Union election, European Parliament elections. So um, do you think the uh, the alliance is ready if Trump comes back, to put it very bluntly? Yeah, and I think actually we're not that, how to put this, let me rephrase it. We had four years uh, where President Trump was president. It was a bit rocky, but A, we came through it, B, we came through it just as strong as we were when it started. And imagine the situation in which NATO was weak now. That would be quite worrying. But third, it's also worth noting that uh, under his presidency, despite, despite the fact that it was complicated for NATO, uh, actually the U.S. increased its troop presence in Europe. Uh, defense spending went up very substantially. And uh, you know, if we hadn't started increasing defense spending, uh, and it got accelerated under Trump for reasons we all know. 
we wouldn't have even the resources we have now to provide support to Ukraine. So actually, you know, in the main points about, you know, the need for better and more balanced uh, burden sharing, uh, those are messages we've heard before. We heard it before him. Okay, his messages are delivered a little bit uh, in a different way uh, than previous presidents uh, had done. But I I'm actually quite confident that we'll make it through. It won't be necessarily exactly what we're doing now. Uh, and I've seen all the ideas that are being put forward. Um, we'll see what happens when when he comes in. But I'm pretty confident, uh, you know, even the people around him who are now publishing all kinds of papers. I mean, you can read about those papers. They don't question NATO. What they they have ideas on how to adapt it, but they don't question NATO as an organization. So I think we'll be fine. That's, that's very good to hear. I'm uh, loving the positive attitude. Uh, let's keep this uh, going. Um, uh, and uh, next question is about China. How will uh, how will NATO approach China in the uh, in the in the summit? Uh, what will be the vision about China as its uh, strategic competitor? So, will, will it go towards Indo-Pacific region? So, I, I think there's some important points. One is NATO doesn't see China as a military threat. And I'm quite sure China doesn't see NATO as a military threat. So, you know, we shouldn't be concerned about that. Where we have a profound concern mm -hmm. is the way in which China is enabling Russia's destabilizing, activi de destabilizing activities and this sort of no limits strategic partnership, uh, which manifests itself in a number of ways. One is, of course, the concrete support to Russia's war effort. And second, concrete contribution to Russia evading the effects of the sanctions which we have put on for its illegal invasion of its neighbors. And as I have said to my Chinese counterparts, for a country that has talked for decades about the importance of sovereignty and territorial integrity, the Chinese position with regard to Russia is impossible. And this war is impossible to reconcile with those two positions. Um, furthermore, China is amplifying Russian communications and messaging uh, on Ukraine and doing it not just in the European space, but also very much in the global south. We do not, we do not welcome these uh, initiatives. We also are concerned when we see Russian military cooperation with China in the Euro-Atlantic area. So this is not us going to the Indo-Pacific. This is China coming into mm -hmm. European security in a very concrete way, enabling a war with, where we are trying to help uh, a country defend its borders and its security and its people. Uh, so uh, that that is why we have uh, issues uh, with China. When we come to technology, as I mentioned before, and that area of competition, there is fair competition to take place and we have to compete. There is also unfair competition. Uh, we, NATO is not an economic organization, so I won't go too much into that. That has to be dealt with, but we do need to compete. But I think that that's a very different discussion than, than the rest of what we are discussing now. So what will the messaging be from the summit? Again, it's under negotiation, but I think the main points will be concern, the concerns I recognized, I, I mentioned, the, uh, the fact that our concerns are about China coming at, into our, the Euro-Atlantic space in a destabilizing way. Third point, NATO is not going to Asia Pacific or Indo-Pacific area, but we have partners there with which we want to work and we will work. Uh, but that doesn't mean we are interfering in Asian security or Indo-Pacific uh, security. We have partnerships and we will not be uh, dissuaded from cooperating with like-minded countries anywhere in the world, as we have partners, for example, in Latin America. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I know there are a lot of questions uh, in the audience as well, so uh, I will uh, keep mine and uh, hope that uh, we are aligning on the questions. Uh, so if there are uh, any so far, let's uh, take one round, please. We have the second question here. Thank you, Phil. Mitoshko, National News Agency of Ukraine. First question is uh, on your profile. 
you know, Ukraine's uh, sad experience uh, shown that uh, the extremely centralized energy uh, grid uh, are vulnerable to the missiles blow. So that uh, does NATO consider some kind of precautious measures inside NATO to avoid such situation in NATO countries? I mean, decentralization of the uh, energy supply, uh, avoiding to build a huge uh, energy plants and so on and so far. This is the first question. And the second question, if I may, uh, concerning the NATO uh, summit, uh, Americans and uh, NATO leadership uh, mentioned that uh, uh, NATO is going to build some kind of breach for NATO, uh, for Ukraine membership in NATO. Uh, but doesn't mean that NATO will introduce uh, uh, again additional, uh, additional barrier like it was before uh, uh, the MAP uh, membership action plan uh, in our form uh, to maybe not to allow uh, Ukraine to immediately move to NATO. Thank you. We had another question over here. Thank you, Anabola from Startcraft. I have a question. When you talked about Russia and the, the kind of long-term hostile attitude which they have, and you said at the same time that we have 10, time, 10 times the resources, which is true, I think, very comforting. But do you think that we in our democratic systems have the ability to direct resources into the defense in a way, to put it just in one word, against that host long-term hostility? We have any other on the floor? Maybe yeah. Too much yeah. Maybe we can take the third one, and I would also encourage our online audience. Uh, yeah. Lena Patbeck, Hey, Corporate Affairs. Uh, my question, maybe also linking to the allocation of defenses, what are your views on the European Defense Industry Program and how that might help to possibly address some of the challenges you highlighted, both with interoperability as well as coordination between EU and NATO on some common uh, strategic priorities? Thank you. Yeah. Let's take this. Uh, okay. So the uh, bridge criteria versus uh, map uh, uh, resources towards defense and interoperability and, strategic yeah, and, and energy grid, which I find so uh, energy security, which I find so interesting. So uh, I think the first point to say is it has been Soviet doctrine, you know this, and then Russian doctrine to go after energy infrastructure. And what we can see in Ukraine is they do it. Kinetic attacks, cyber attacks, and they have basically pounded 50% of the Ukrainian energy infrastructure into the ground. And when winter comes, it's going to be very complicated for Ukraine. Um, only the nuclear power plants have been spared and even barely spared, as we have seen in Zaporizhia and then elsewhere. Um, and you know this, but Ukraine learned some lessons from 2014, uh, including, for example, to air gap from cyber attack critical infrastructure. So while we're putting everything onto a internet of things grid, the lessons we can learn from Ukraine are that's not necessarily a wise thing to do. So we have a dialogue with Ukraine uh, to learn the lessons uh, at the same time as trying to provide all kinds of support. As you know very well, we're all providing generators and grids and uh, spare parts and alternative uh, routing of electric electricity from the EU. So there's a lot going on, but we are trying to learn those lessons. Um, and, and part of our NATO Ukraine council discussions are precisely on this. What will help will be the energy transition because the energy transition in all of our countries means you're going to have a much wider mix of solar, uh, wind, coal, nuclear, gas, LNG, and all of that will be on a cyber grid run by AI, and which will take what's available when it comes out. So you do get a lot of decentralization naturally through the, through the energy transition, but it also poses in particular a cyber risk. Uh, so it, it's a really, really important question. We are very conscious of it and trying to help also in, in this regard. So on the bridge to membership, we'll see what the final language is. I think based on what I know, you should not expect new barriers. That is not the idea. We, we removed membership action plan precisely to take a step out uh, in the same way that Sweden didn't have to go through it. Ukraine doesn't have to go through it. So there's no intent to put new barriers. It is the case, and everyone knows this, that 
it is also important that reforms take place to prepare Ukraine for membership. Uh, it has to be that certain standards are met. Uh, we understand this is not the most easy thing to do in the middle of a war. So I think you'll see some sort of messaging on uh, the need for reforms. But I do not think you will see the introduction of new barriers or new hurdles uh, in the way that MAP became in some ways a hurdle to uh, getting closer to membership. Uh, then uh, are we able to direct our resources to, to defense? I mean, I'd say the answer is yes in two ways. One is if you look back to the 70s and 80s, we did. Uh, defense spending in NATO countries was above 4%. There were huge amounts of the necessary equipment the right mindset, big exercises. It wasn't that long ago. I, you know, I, I'd just been born, but I remember it. Uh, so it's not like we can't do it. We did it. We did it in our lifetimes. Uh, not your lifetime, uh, <laughs> but mine. Uh, second point is it's happening now. Look at Poland. It's heading for 4% right now. It is buying tens of billions of euros worth of military equipment, and it's going to put it into the field. Uh, Germany, 100 billion outside of its defense budget, and they're talking about more. The German defense minister is talking about 3.5% uh, defense spending. So, and in general, populations are not questioning this. Industry is looking for contracts, but it's there. So I think it's perfectly plausible, and the Russians are doing their absolute best to convince us that this is a good idea. Uh, so uh, I think we will, I think we can do it. Uh, when it comes to European defense, so I think the first point to mention is with Sweden and Finland joining NATO, 96% of the population of the European Union is now in NATO. Uh, so I start to feel like we need to get over our institutional differences, because if you're a taxpayer, you think like, what is, what are you even talking about? You know, we're in these two organizations, so get on with it, uh, bureaucrats, and make it all work. Uh, and, and we need to really do that. Um, we, you know, we always say we support more spending on European defense. We do. Uh, European capabilities will be made available to NATO like they're made available to the EU because basically there's only four countries in the EU that are not in NATO and they're all neutrals. So, you know, and they're not the biggest. So it, it's a win. Where we have a problem is if the EU were to develop standards for interoperability, for example, which would somehow be different from NATO's. That is an impossibility for our armed forces or for our industry to manage. And in general, I think that's going okay, but it is imperative that the EU does not innovate in this area and just accepts NATO standard. I just want to be blunt about it. Uh, because we cannot operate with different sets of standards. We also can't have duplicative command structures that take away our limited number of soldiers to just do just do EU operations, et cetera. So it's more in the standards and in the structures that we have concerns. In the capability area, we're all for it. Great idea. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your uh, answers. And I would uh, like to encourage our all-night audience to uh ask questions in the q a box uh meanwhile i think we have uh, still some time for another round of uh of uh questions and we will go just a bit over time if that's okay with you a couple of minutes there's one question hey james it's not a question it's uh Could you please identify yourself i uh, got from the chinese mission uh, James talked about uh, his discussions. He talked about uh, his conversation with the Chinese counterpart. Actually, I understand that's me, right? Uh, <laughs> we had this very difficult conversation about two months ago. Um, yes, regarding this Ukraine war, um, this effect, we don't see eye to eye on this issue. Uh, but if you look at the big picture, it's not between China with vis a vis um, US or, or NATO. Um, actually, if you look at the global south, as I told you last time, our position actually very much similar 
to the developing countries like India, like Indonesia, South Africa, and also the recent proposal from, Ch from China and Brazil, the sixth proposal regarding a, a solution to the Ukraine crisis also shows that we are different regarding the origin of this crisis and regarding the way forward. Okay, that is a fact. Um, yeah, and also you talk about a lot of the, the problems going on, as I told you last time, uh, some of the problems are not from China. I know a lot of people in this part of the world would like to see China play a more active role, like more affirmative role, like condemn Russia and to cut trade with Russia so that it seems everything will be fine. The recent uh, talk by uh, the Finland president is that if our president make a phone call, then the, the war will be over. That's not the case. It's not that simple. Uh, I mean, I don't have too much time, but the things that we have, I mean, Russia is a sovereign state, like Ukraine is a sovereign state. China continue to conduct its relationship with those countries. A lot of people fail to recognize that China is the largest trade partner of Ukraine for many years. And also still China is the largest trading partner of Ukraine. So our relationship with Russia is long, is multifaceted, and we will continue to have that relationship. You know, we have a long border. We have that discussion last time. So that was your be question, sir. As I said, I don't have a question. I have to respond to what uh, James just mentioned, right? Uh, it's the Ukraine war. I know this is a very difficult topic, but we have to set the facts right, okay? Uh, that is the first point. Also, he talked about cyber security uh, issue. I also have to respond, especially this World uh, Typhoon report. Uh, there's a clear response from China because uh, several of the agencies, like the National Laboratories on Cybersecurity Threat, uh, together with other two agencies, conducted uh, a, a, a study into this, this report. And our study uh, found no linkage at all whatsoever. Because if you look at that threat, it not only targeted uh, like uh, United States, because this is a report from U US, right? It also targeted many other countries, including uh, some of the developing countries. So the conclusion that this is a dark, so-called dark force, it does not have any linkage to a state or a state country or, or a country. So, but, but if you talk about cybersecurity, I find it's a bit rich <laughs> when you try to say you are innocent in this exercise because this is a, this is a very complicated issue and China is a victim. Our, many of our strategic important agencies have been uh, attacked and that is a fact. Thank uh, you, sir. Sorry, we're, we're quite limited with time, so. Yes, uh, I just want to, to make it clear. And um, this is a long story and we have to get every perspective, uh, you know, um, known to, to, to all of us. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we had uh, one more question here. Hello, my name is Vav Zinchenko. I'm a program assistant in the European Policy Center. And uh, I have a question. Um, there was a couple of days ago, there was a report of um, a senior official in the US State Department said that Ukraine is going to be told that it's too corrupt to join NATO. I don't know if you're aware of that, but it, it was quite a big let's say, uh, news for me, at least. You know, the question is, do you think, uh, well, during the summit, will, be, will there be any other additional steps for Kiev to follow? I know you already answered to that, but you know, since we have such reports, especially coming from the U.S. Uh, State Department, coming, uh, you know, it's it just doesn't really make sense. Um, also, uh, what's your perception on exception of Ukraine in NATO with its problematics, domestic problematics? Also, looking at the cases of North Macedonia and uh, of uh, Albania, and uh, how do you see it in the next years, five years, let's say, uh, the um, Ukrainian accession to NATO possible? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, we'll conclude. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, this this is the million dollar question, and I think it's very difficult to predict five years from now uh, on this issue. Uh, you know, because political winds uh, can can change, but the, the commitment to Ukraine joining NATO is very strong. Uh, the the two thousand and eight statement you know i was there at the time and since then and for georgia it's been a very complicated uh story to sort of interpret it 
But I think we should, we need to look at the good side of that statement, which is it's quite clear. So it doesn't set a time frame, but it's quite clear. And we have kept to it. We've kept repeating it in public, which, you know, you can easily just stop saying something rather than just have a consensus to not do it. You could just stop saying it and let it drift, but they didn't do that and they don't do it. And it will be very clear. I think again, coming out of Washington, uh, as I said, I, I don't foresee new barriers or new programs of, of, uh, membership uh, criteria as we had with with the map. Uh, but there will be a message on reform. That's that's absolutely clear. And it's a real concern. I mean, I, I don't want to deny it. I think it would probably be a real concern for Ukrainians as well uh, to, to see the system reform. And President Zelensky is making all kinds of moves uh, to try to improve transparency and fight corruption and, and make sure that all the money that's going in goes to where it's supposed to go uh, because it is traditionally a bit sensitive in, in war zones uh, that sometimes the tracking the money isn't uh, as effective as it could be. So, you know, where will it go in five years? I don't know. But what I do know is everybody understands that Ukraine's territorial integrity, its security, its stability is essential for European security. This is not an abstract statement. It's also a very self-interested statement because, you know, if somehow the situation would be different, obviously Europe would be much less stable. Russia would be right on our borders. So it's, you know, it's, it's very much in our interest to have Ukraine be strong and standing on its feet uh, and to have security assurances of one kind or another, uh, which eventually will be NATO membership. But there's all kinds of discussions. You're perfectly well aware of what steps could be taken in the run-up to, whenever that is, uh, Ukrainian membership in NATO, which can enhance Ukraine's security. At the same time, you help Ukraine fight uh, fight corruption and, and, and reform. Thank you. Um, thank you for answering all the questions from the audience. Uh, one last question before we uh, close the session. Uh, Next week, it will be definitely a celebratory uh, uh, summit. Uh, what would be your vision for next 75 years in 30 seconds? Uh, well, I'll say this, just this. The world is really kind of unstable now. NATO, I, I, and I don't mean this as a slogan, is actually a pillar of stability for a billion people. Uh, and we really need it. So the only vision I have is that we kind of, the organization stays strong, that we, I would really like to see us kind of overcome the barriers with the EU and also to avoid distances between Europe and North America. This team needs to stay together because there's another team and it has a big, uh, big community uh, with values we don't share. Uh, in the case of Russia, very destabilizing. So we need to stick together. So that's my hope uh, for NATO strong uh, and continuing to provide this pillar of stability that, that the whole world needs. Thank you. Uh, so on this uh, positive note of uh, NATO as a pillar of stability, thanks again for shedding light on, uh, on innovation, cyber, uh, hybrid, uh, energy security, uh, as well as uh, what is coming up for Ukraine. Um, uh, what we expect if Trump returns. Uh, glad to hear that NATO will be stable, even if that happens. Uh, and uh, yeah, EPC will uh, continue uh, working on NATO uh, matters. Uh, we, we will have a compendium coming uh, up, uh, published uh, tomorrow morning. So that, so that will be a perfect weekend ring the, about the expectations and priorities for the upcoming summit uh, next week. Uh, uh, and uh, um, I have nothing else left to say than to thank you for joining us. I know it uh, is not fair uh, to fit everything, all these topics in 45 minutes, but uh, we will definitely continue talking uh, about this and discussing further. Thank you. Thank you.